So welcome to today's Local Poker Norming session and check-in. Today is kind of a mishmash of topics. And let me just give you a, a sort of thumbnail of what we're going to do. There'll be a few announcements. Then we want to share with you some updates about local poker certified colleges, the idea of independent course alignment, because we've had some questions about that, and then integrating with the course finder and making sure courses are showing on the um, in the course finder, and then share with you a number of resources and reminders, things that leads can share with your team, and tips and uh, resources for doing accessibility reviews. And then we'll get to the norming conversations. There's a few um, rubric items that when I asked you all, what were things that maybe were giving teams trouble? These were the suggestions that came back. So we'll talk about them together and then wrap it up. So first thing is upcoming dates. The next two uh, poker norming sessions are already slated. They'll be from 10 to noon on Zoom. Wednesday, January 19th of 2022. Can you believe we're already almost a quarter of the way into this century? And the following one will be on Tuesday, May 17th, also in 2022. Uh, and I'll be sending out reminders. So, we now have 26 colleges that are either in phase one of becoming a local poker certified college or are fully certified. And let me just explain to you briefly um, what we mean by phase one certified and fully certified. Our goal is for CVC reviewers to not be checking every single course that is submitted to us from a local poker team. So once we know a local review team is really solid and you know everybody's interpreting things the same way, we want to move to a sporadic schedule of checking the submissions from that college. So you'll still be doing the local poker review and working with the faculty, sending it to us so we can get it into the course finder with the quality reviewed badge. And then we'll just be doing sporadic um, intermittent checking of you know, every few courses to make sure everybody's still on track. I'm sure all of you have found it to be true that one's review skills get stronger the more reviews one does. So someone right out of the poker training may well have a few knowledge gaps, even though they successfully completed the course. And so for that reason, we have found an iterative certification process is really most successful for review teams. So what we're now calling phase one is when a college submits their initial three verification courses and the CVC reviewers look them over and they find a few items that the college indicated were aligned, but we don't yet consider to be aligned. So our reviewers marked it incomplete and gave feedback. So we'll then meet with the review team to do some individual norming and clear up any of those gaps in understanding. And several of, of the, um, well, of those 26, that's what you've been going through. Um, and then the college works with the instructors to address those remaining incompletes based on the CVC reviewer feedback. And then they'll let us know when the courses are ready for a recheck and our reviewers will go back in and either say, yep, you nailed it this time or, oh, there's still one little tweak. And so that back and forth will continue until all three of those verification courses are fully aligned and they get the quality reviewed batch. And then the college is at phase one, local poker certified college. They will then submit another round of three verification courses with the goal being that this time, the three courses, our reviewers will find them to be clean, meaning that, yep, we agree, everything is aligned. And so then the college is fully certified, meaning they can submit courses individually and they'll just be on a sporadic review schedule by our CVC reviewers, usually about every third course for accessibility and every fourth or fifth course for sections A through C. If the second round of verification courses again has some things that our reviewers feel are not yet aligned, we'll again work with the review team on any misinterpretations of the rubric 
And the college again works with the instructors to address the remaining incompletes. And so we'll just do that back and forth until the courses are aligned. And so we'll just continue supporting a local review team through iterations of this verification process so that they're able to submit a set of clean courses, meaning their team really has it solid and everybody's on the same page in terms of interpreting the rubric, and then they would be fully certified. The distinction is really not that great. You've already gone through, you've got your team, everything's going well, we're there to support you. And we will certainly your, um, what do we call ourselves? Local Poker Guide, Sean, Cheryl, or I, will let you know if we, um, well, you'll know if the course is heading completes that we're going to go through another verification round. And then once we let you know, yep, all three courses when you submitted them are fully aligned, then you'll be fully certified. And so it's it's a kind of a fine line. It's really more, are, are we still continuing to support you with the courses or are you kind of on your own and we're just checking? And those sporadic checks, we may find things that are incomplete and we'll let you know what our reviewers said and send it back. Some of you on the call have experience with that and you can say, yeah, they continue to check and they continue to tell us when they find things that are incomplete. So it's just kind of a, a way for us to know is the school still, um, is it appropriate for us to still be more involved with the local poker team or not? So we can talk more about that in a bit, but I just kind of wanted to let you know, we got 26 colleges that are already in phase one or fully certified, as I said, so that's fabulous. We're working our way through. Um, Bob has a quest for, Bob Nash, um, and it's not just Bob, but it's it's Jamie and Jory and all everybody. They are looking particularly for courses that have been aligned to the rubric that are also fully OER courses. They're hundred percent open educational resources, either that's been developed by the instructor or that is um, publicly available OER. And so, just giving you a heads up that we have added that question to both the verification submission form and to the local poker submission forms. You'll see it now says, has this course been authored solely by the instructor listed or assembled with 100% openly licensed content? And that's just because we're trying to um, get more data about the courses that we can offer students and that we can also track and, and do that kind of stuff. Um, so there's that. Another thing that um, has been in the work workings and that we're very close to going public with is the idea of an independent course alignment process, meaning, and that name is a little bit um, misleading. Basically what it means is it's a course that has gone through the review process and has been designated as quality reviewed. And the instructor of the course is willing to share their course shell with other instructors so that if that other instructor has also been through the review process, so they are themselves an aligned instructor, if you will, they would be able to teach that independently aligned course as a quality reviewed course in the course finder. Hopefully I said that in a way that made sense. Some of you are already doing that locally on your campuses. Instructor A aligns course one and instructor B aligns course two. And then instructor A can teach course two and instructor B can teach course one because both the courses and the instructors have gone through the review process. The instructors understand the rubric. They know how to maintain alignment you know, they're, they're, they're competent in that. And so they're able to take that aligned course that somebody else developed and teach it as a quality reviewed course. This is simply opening up the scope of that to a more systemic way of doing it. As I said, it's not fully in place yet. It's something that Jamie and Jory and Bob have been working on with um, Cheryl, Sean and my input. 
and it's close to going live. Some people have been asking about it. So just wanted to give you an update that it is coming and there will be more information at the next consortium meeting. So you can ask questions uh, there if you have them. Helen, did you want to take questions now or wait? Uh, I, I can do some now. Did, is there one you want to have me answer? Yeah, the other ones I've been trying to take care of, but um, how do you address courses that have been aligned at other colleges? Great question. And it's it's sort of the same. So if an instructor has aligned a course with, say, Chafee College, but they're going to teach the exact same course at Los Rios, they would the Los Rios person would let us know, hey, um, Jane Smith also teaches at Chafee. She already got English 101 aligned there, so we can see it in our records. She's going to teach the exact same course here at Los Rios. And so then Stacy would have that information. She'd be able to verify, yep, Jane did it. And yep, it was the English 101 at Chafee. So now we can say when Los Rios offers that course taught by Jane, it's also got the quality reviewed badge. So basically, you would just give um, Stacy a heads up with the necessary details so that she can verify, and then we'll be able to let the Quotely process know that it's the same course. You have to make sure, though, it can't be a similar course. It needs to be the same course. Um, but hopefully that answers your question. And Cheryl, is there something else? I know there's a lot coming in. One, well, yeah, one quick follow up. So. Um, Jennifer asks, in the course finder, only the course author can teach the quality reviewed course? No, that's what I'm explaining. If there is another instructor who has been through the review process, so not just somebody off the street who doesn't even know what the rubric is, they don't get to teach it as a quality. They can always obviously teach it, but it won't have the quality reviewed designation unless the new instructor has been through the review process themselves so that they understand how to maintain alignment with the rubric as they make the inevitable tweaks that we know instructors are always making to their courses. Hopefully that makes sense. Yep. And um, just those that have questions about your own college, I think it's probably quicker if you give it, you know, ask us in an ID. email. Ask your ID because they will have more information. Yeah, okay, great. continue. Okay, thank you, Cheryl, for monitoring that. So the next thing I wanted to mention is about courses. In, well, actually, before I do that, I want to make one quick little thing because we had some questions come up. As it says on the local poker site in the tab about getting certified, deans and college instructional designers may be part of the local review team if you have local academic Senate approval. So it's fine with CBC OEI if deans and instructional designers are a part of the team as long as they've successfully completed poker, but you also have to have local academic Senate approval. We are not giving carte blanche approval for that. We figure it's a college decision. And so just if you wanna have deans and IDs, just get approval from your local, uh, your academic Senate and then send them through poker. Okay, so that's that. Then courses in Course Finder. Cheryl, Sean, and I are not an active part of the integration team with Quotely. And so if you have questions about why a particular course isn't showing up in the Course Finder with the quality review designation when you know it's already been aligned, you're going to want to email support at cvc.edu so that your question can get routed to the right person. What I will tell you here is there are two things that have to happen for a course to be badged in the CBC course finder tool at cbc.edu. First, we, CBC OEI, need to tell Quotely, which is the company that manages the application, the integration tool, that a particular instructor and or course has earned the quality review badge. Second, the college needs to send CVC Quotely, we share it, their course schedule information at least once per term so that we know what courses you're currently offering. There's a way of doing it automatically with what's called the read only API, where CVC takes the schedule data right from your uh, 
the college's class schedule database. And I'm going to put in chat two ways of doing it. There's a self-service process, and let me put that in there now. And I don't know who at your campus, some campuses, it's the poker lead that deals with this. Other people have the Canvas admin. I don't know at your campus who's the person that's going to be working on the integration. That's part of why I'm saying Cheryl, Sean, and I don't have all the answers to this. But I'm just giving you what I know so that you can begin if you're having trouble finding courses that you know have been aligned. This is the steps you're going to take. So there's the self-service process. And then there's where you can, that's where we go into the database. You give us access to the database. Then there's a way where you send us a CSV file, which we then share with Quotely. And here's directions for following that process. One big thing to be aware of. Colleges are sometimes giving us different course information or instructor names than what is showing in their course schedule. And that's a big reason why you're not seeing the course showing in Quotely properly. So for example, a, a college will tell us in their list when they send us the list of here's what we're currently teaching. They will say HIST 110, but the course catalog actually says history 110. Now, the Quotely software is just an algorithm. It's not a person using their brain saying, oh, hist and history are the same thing. It's an algorithm that you know has to be exact. So Quotely software can't locate that course and say, yes, hist 110 and history 110 are the same. So I'm going to give it the quality. I'm going to show it as a quality reviewed course. We need the exact course ID and exact instructor name as shown in the course catalog for your college. Hopefully that makes sense, but that's a big reason why people are not finding the course is because there's some discrepancy between what the catalog says and what you told us in the list of courses and faculty. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay, I'm gonna go on to the next Real thing. quick though, yeah. um, just to clear this up so it doesn't keep going on in chat. Ingrid asked about, are you talking about just non-faculty, but if a dean or instructional designer are faculty at your college, they still- yeah, They're want, faculty. Yeah, they're faculty, but you still wanna make sure that you get approval because sometimes, you know, we've had it where the instructional designer is a faculty member, but they're only part-time, you know, that kind of stuff. So just clear it, make sure you clear it with your Senate so that there's no problem. So that you don't, yeah, you don't run into any issues. So just make right. sure your Senate is in accordance with whatever decisions you're making about the review team. I just wanted to let you know, we don't have a problem necessarily if deans and instructional designers are involved in course review. We just want to make sure your college is also okay with it. So there you go. Thanks, Cheryl. Okay, so now a few resources. The course design resources, and I'm, gonna sh I'm doing this, these as kind of reminders because we always have new people on the call and also because human nature being what it is, we don't always pay attention to something until we need it. So I'm just reminding you of things so that when you need it, you'll think, oh yeah, I remember she told me there was this thing and now I know where to go find it. So a couple of different resources that I wanna make sure you're aware of. In the course design resources shell, which is a companion piece to the rubric and provides greater explanation, tips and examples to help faculty implement the various rubric items. We've also added a tab for reviewers. So I just wanna show you, you can send faculty here and they've got the what and why, which explains what aligned is, why it's important, how it helps student success, gives tips and examples. And then on the four reviewers tab, it gives where to look for this and what you should be looking for. So it can help local reviewers, especially those who are still getting their reviewing chops um, together, can help remind you, this is what we're looking for when you are determining alignment with this particular rubric item. 
So that is a public course. It's available to everybody. And many of you probably already have it bookmarked. I will put, or Cheryl, maybe you can put the URL in chat as well. It's on the local, re local poker resource center, which is the other really useful course design resources and the resource center are really useful for um, poker leads and any of the review team people. So what I wanted to mention about this site is the certification uh, tab, which will go through the steps so you can follow those for how you get certified and it explains about the verification process that I just went through. We've also added on the certification tab, where did I put it? There, a link to the crowdsourced ideas that we came up with, I think it was two poker normings ago. And let me show you what it looks like. It's just a Google Doc where different colleges are sharing their ideas and resources that helped get their local poker um, process up and running. So it's a crowdsourced resource that everybody can use. And again, you'll find it on the certification tab on the Local Poker Resource Center. It says, here's a crowdsourced set of ideas for local poker prep. So I wanted you to know that was available. Also here on this uh, site, I wanna make sure people are aware of, excuse me, it's not there on the site, something else is, I'll get to that. The Poker Training Participation Agreement Form. That is the first step for anybody who's gonna be enrolled in the poker training. We wanna make sure they understand what's gonna be expected, that it's not open to all faculty, it's only for people that are gonna be part of the review team for their college, et cetera, et cetera. So we wanna make sure that you local poker leads are aware this is what you're gonna share with people when they say, hey, I wanna be a reviewer, or when you've asked someone to be a reviewer and they now are gonna go through the poker training. This is where they'll find the dates for what uh, poker trainings are coming up and where they're going to indicate that, yes, I understand all of these different things. We want to make sure that you also, when you're letting people um, sharing this with them and telling them what they need to do, it's a two step process. And we try to make it really clear here. We make it clear in the confirmation email. This isn't enrolling them in the course. This just is indicating which date they prefer and then the um, agreements. Then they're gonna get a follow-up email that has the link in it for actually enrolling in the course. And I underscore this over and over because we every single time have at least one or two people who get in touch with us on the first day of the course and say, why am I not seeing it? And it's because they didn't actually finish the enrollment process. They filled out the agreement form, but they didn't click the registration link in the follow-up email. So I just wanna make sure you all are crystal clear, tell your faculty that are gonna become reviewers, it's a two-step process. And also please tell them, do not share the enrollment link with any of their colleagues. Everyone who's enrolled in poker needs to fill out the participant agreement because we just wanna make sure everybody's got the same understanding going into the training. Let me know if there's a question, Cheryl, that I should answer about that. Doesn't look like it. Okay, anybody have a live question they need to ask about getting people signed up for the poker training? Yes, I will put the link to the agreement in chat. We don't post it publicly because we don't want to confuse regular faculty who may not realize this is not intended as a way of learning about the rubric. It's only intended for um, faculty who are gonna become reviewers. So we don't post it publicly. We only ask you local poker leads to share with your uh, potential reviewers. Uh, poker agreement. Okay, it should now be in chat. Please bookmark it so you've always got it available. And there you go. All right, the thing that I was gonna share with you that is on the Local Poker Resource Center site is the Local Poker Submission Form. It's a very handy document. 
It's available on your dashboards if you're involved in local poker. It's also, I believe, on the verification application form, and it's in the local poker resource center. And it just tells you everything we would like you to do with the courses before you submit it to us. So it talks about getting the rubric document ready in the right way, it talks about addressing accessibility in a way that's going to make it easier for your people as well as our reviewers. Uh, how to prepare the course shell, to add us, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very handy document. It's available on the local poker resource site. And yeah, that's it. One thing I'm going to mention specifically about this is the importance of the naming convention. It's mentioned here in the section on preparing the course shell. And any of you that have submitted your own course for review, you have already been aware of this, but we just want to make sure anybody that hasn't gone through review and the local poker leads understand it's not just an arbitrary reason. We really would like you to follow the naming convention that we suggest here, because just like you guys, we have hundreds and hundreds of courses on our in our instance of Canvas. And it's really hard for our reviewers to find the correct course that they, ne they need to go review if the naming convention is not the one that they're expecting. And we have colleges submit courses with all kinds of different names. And it doesn't always make sense and it's not easy to find. So you can name shells locally in whatever way you want to, of course. But when you're submitting that copy shell to us for review, please follow the naming convention. And I will just let you in on a little secret that won't come as a surprise if you know me at all. If people send us with the wrong naming convention, I always tell Stacy, send it back and tell them they need to rename it with the right name so that we know what we're doing. So we just wanna make sure that you're following that naming convention. If a course does not have a CID, give it the local, obviously. I mean, if there is no CID, there's no CID. So give it your local course ID. But if there is a CID, that's the one we'd like you to use and the instructor name. So you can just follow the naming convention, um, please. Okay, what else did I wanna talk about? Uh, oh, Stacy sends out periodically a way, a link to a form where you can update who is the local poker lead? We know those change. We know you add co-leads. You know, we know things are evolving all the time. So she just sends that out, I think, three or four times a year. But it may be that you had a change and it's not the time when Stacy sends it. So you can always um, let us know that you would like to update that. Stacy, do you want them contacting support or do you want them actually using the form? Can you unmute and tell us? Um, can you tell me that again? <laughs> so you're, the, well, the update People goes are updating out. the local poker lead. Do you prefer yeah. that they contact support at CVC to say what they, that they need to update it? Or do you want to give them a link? Um, you can, you can contact support at CVC. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, what you would tell support. me um, So support it's here on the, the, um, resource center and resource site in a couple of places. And what'll happen is Stacy will send you the form and you can fill it out. It's got directions. Yeah, the reason why I was pausing was just because I think like you mentioned, the update goes out, I think three times a year. I so you, um, you should also receive, yeah. um, receive that. But if things change quickly, yeah, you can just go to support. Yeah, or maybe the update just went out and then next month it changes right. and you wanna let us know. Because one thing to be aware also, I only send my little notifications of the poker normings and everything to the people that we have listed as local poker leads. So if you've got a new lead and you wanna make sure they're getting that information, please make sure their name is on uh, updated on that form. Okay. Next thing, requesting a list of faculty who've completed poker training. Many colleges ask us, it, just so you're aware, it's a manual, rather time-consuming process for Stacy. 
catalog, which is our registration um, application, doesn't have an easy way to compile that information. So Stacy kind of has to do it course by course, you know, term by term to figure out. So emailing us saying, hey, I need this information is not the best way to go about it because we don't have an easy way to get that information. Plus, we can only look at the email. And so if it's a district address, we can't sort by college or if faculty have used that have gone through the poker training used a Gmail or a Yahoo or some other address, we have no idea what college they're with based on the um, data that Stacy is able to use when searching. So we can't give you a complete list of who has successfully completed poker. We can maybe give you a partial list. What we highly recommend is that you survey the faculty, your faculty that have gone through poker training. And now remember, they can't get the link to register unless you've given it to them. So in theory, you already know who has gone through poker so that you can then ask those people, hey, send me your badge showing that you completed successfully so that you're able to track in a much more accurate way who has completed poker than we're gonna be able to do. So I just wanted to let you know, it's not a simple thing. So if you're asking us to do it, it's gonna be incomplete and it's pretty time consuming for Stacy to do. Stacy, anything you need to add about that? Maybe not, but just wanted to no, give you the I, opportunity. I, no, I think that's good. Okay. So, uh, okay. Next thing I wanted to talk about is, do I need to go back to my slides? Well, okay. We're almost to the part where we're going to let you talk. I know I've been doing a lot of talking. Tips on how to do an accessibility review. We still hear from some colleges that they're, they're feeling like they're kind of muddling through that. So we wanted to just give you a quick rundown as we've talked before about what we think are the best ways to approach accessibility reviews. And the very first thing, and I know Cheryl and Sean will be putting exclamation marks after this with me, Train your faculty on proper formatting in Canvas and in documents. Start with faculty so that when they're sending you courses, you're not having to go back and retrofit. It's starting with as clean a course as possible because the individual instructors understand what accessibility guidelines they need to be following and how to use Canvas and Word or whatever to format properly. So train, 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 train is your first line of defense in getting accessible courses. You also want to make sure they understand that all content, which includes Canvas pages, documents, videos, podcasts, any content that's in the course needs to be made accessible. And so you have several resources that we can offer. Um, there is section D in the course design resources shell which I showed you earlier, section D goes through each of the accessibility, the big seven, I call them, plus how to deal with documents. So all of that is there as a resource that you can offer your faculty. Helen, one quick note. Yep. They're a little confused. They're looking for the reviewer tab in section D, but that's oh. not in there because- No, because, um, I'm just, thank you. I'm just about to get to, we have a, another little course that is about reviewing for section D. I may go back and add it in section D. It just got kind of complicated and this course already dealt with it. So let me share with you in chat a course we have made. And now hold on, somebody texted me. So I got to go back to everyone. This is an open course that you can share with your review team faculty so that they understand how to be what they should be looking for and the best way to approach an accessibility review. Um, it's pretty comprehensive. A lot of it is the same information as what you find in section D because looking for accessibility formatting is often very much related to formatting it originally. So using the little man in Canvas, using Pope Tech, if your college has enabled it. And I would highly recommend if your college has not yet enabled it, that you move heaven and earth to get your Canvas admin or whoever it is 
to enable it. It will make life so much sweeter for your faculty and for you reviewers. And one quickie, I yep. posted the link to the newer accessibility, you know, Canvas accessibility course. Yeah. And for those of you in the chat, um, that's not our course. It's from the Accessibility Center. So I will find out for you when they will update it in comments, because right now it's not in comments. The newer and, and to add on to what Cheryl's saying, because it was done by Liesl and the Accessibility Center, we won't be able to answer questions about it. You'll have to ask them. We have the reviewing section D that I just shared with you. That one we did, so we can answer questions about that. But the 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 self, what do we call it? Self-paced yeah. um, ones were all done by the Accessibility Center. Although there is an adoptable version of the section D in Commons, right? I yeah, think so. Yeah, anyhow. OK, also. Um, the other thing I wanted to remind people of, we have a Google Doc that is examples of feedback verbiage for each of the rubric elements, an example of what incomplete narrative might be and what an aligned narrative might be. We didn't go into exemplary just because. I'm going to give you the link. It's a Google Doc. You can share it with your review team. Keep in mind, of course, these are just suggestions. Obviously, the course somebody is looking at isn't going to match exactly the feedback that is being given, but it can give you an idea of um, the structure, you know, the complement, the um, evidence, suggestion, all that kind of stuff. And it can give you some kind of stock phrases to help because you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to make sure that every single feedback narrative you write is unique. If course A has the same issues for B2 that course B does, give them the same feedback. You don't have to make it be totally unique. So get your stock phrases and your, um, I would call it a cheat sheet personally. But so we wanted to offer you this as a way to help um, give a little jump start to your reviewers in terms of writing feedback narratives as they're getting started on their journey to becoming that stellar reviewer that we know everyone is going to be. Uh, yeah, I think that's that's it for those. The last thing I want to mention before we get into the um, norming stuff is it's really important that those of you that are attending the norming sessions serve as conduits for your local team because we know not everyone on every local team is attending. So you wanna be sure and develop some kind of process for your team for passing along the information that's being shared in our discussions here today so that you were norming everybody, whether it be firsthand or secondhand, but everybody that is doing review is getting the same information. So we really rely on you that are here in person to be that conduit back to the people on your team that aren't able to be here in person. Okay, any questions about all that stuff before we get into the rubric elements that we wanna discuss? And I see the chat just flying, so I can't keep track of it. Cheryl, is there a question I missed? Uh, let me see, the, a little bit about accessibility. They were carrying on the conversation about Ally and Katie was saying, what was good and bad, but not about, um, yeah, unless I missed one. Okay. Um, Meg, I'm not sure what you mean. Does this, does that count? It doesn't count as, so what Meg said is, does that, and I think you mean going back and sharing with your team, does that count as norming? It doesn't count as fulfilling the requirement to attend norming sessions. We have that requirement where everyone on the team needs to attend at least two norming sessions a year. And our reasoning behind that is if somebody isn't ever attending norming sessions, they're not as likely going to be a strong reviewer. It's just, you know, they're not part of the conversation. They're not hearing things. They're not asking their questions. So we just came up with that. Um, 
it is always a good idea to make sure if somebody isn't at the norming session that they get some kind of summary of the important points so that they can ask questions and get clarifications. But that second hand or watching the video later alone doesn't qualify as attending the session. That's why we try, we have set up the sessions to be on different days of the week, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, so that ultimately somebody will be able to attend at some point because if we always had it on Wednesday and they always teach at that time on Wednesday, that wasn't gonna work. So we tried to do the alternate. Anyhow, don't wanna get into that too much. You can ask us questions, but that's the basic guideline is everyone on the review team needs to attend at least two a year and at least two people from a review team should be at every norming session so that we've got two conduits going back and sharing with the rest of the team. More is better if you can, but we know that's not always possible. So we just came up with the two and two as our guidelines to make sure that we are keeping norming consistent across all of the colleges that are involved. I think Teresa has her hand up. Okay, Teresa, thank you. Yeah, I was just wondering if all of these uh, great resources that you shared with us are available in the poker course. I'm about to start a poker course here soon. And um, I don't know if I, I should try to, you know, I'd like to share these resources with them, but I don't know if feel, they're all Feel there. free. Some of them are in there, some of them aren't. Okay. Um, because they're constantly being developed. And so we're not always going back and updating in the course itself. Um, because partly also you don't want to overwhelm the new reviewers with too many things, but certainly I, you might feel comfortable sharing the course design resources mm -hmm. thing as something they can go back to. Um, all the other stuff may be a little premature just because they might feel overwhelmed. Well, the, actually, actually, the reviewing uh, section D is definitely embedded in there. And I think the yeah, that is. Seven is, yeah. But right. maybe, um, maybe you can do an announcement with some of the other newer ones. Right. Yeah. Depending on what their interests are and right. experience and all that. Great. Right. Thank you. And then as local poker leads, of course, you want to feel free. You're going to know your team's um, skill level and needs and all that way better than we are. So absolutely share these resources in whatever way makes sense so that everyone on your team is getting access to them. Okay. Next, let's talk about a few, there we go. Let's have some norming conversations. A9 is one that people told me there's still a little bit of conversation about. And if we go into course design resources and look at A9, it is the one that is instructions for learners. This is specifically intended to be addressing the, um, not textbooks. Students pretty much know what to do with textbooks and most textbooks have a lot of explanatory information about what should be going on. So we're not saying you need, to, faculty need to provide instructions for how to use a textbook. What this particular item is really aiming at supporting students in understanding how to interact with supplemental content like web articles, videos, um, PowerPoints, things that are standalone that if you were in a face-to-face -face class, you would automatically give a little context to. You'd say, okay, I'm gonna show you this video and here's why it's related to this week's topic. And here's what I want you paying attention to. And here's when you're gonna be tested on, you know, whatever that is. All of that kind of just happens organically in a face-to-face -face context. Because you're not, the faculty are not there face-to-face -face with the student, we wanna make sure they are providing students with that same kind of context in the online environment. So that's what this is about. <clears throat> just providing the context saying, this video is about the Revolutionary War. That doesn't tell students what they need to know in order to interact meaningfully with the content. So you wanna be sure and let them know things like, when are they gonna use the information from this? What are they gonna be expected to know from it? What do you want them or what is the instructor? 
want them paying attention to. Help the instructor understand that students are going to be much more likely to glean the desired information from the resource if they're told what and how they sh should be looking for. Hopefully that makes sense. So that's what A9 is about. So just saying, um, watch the video or watch the PowerPoint, that's not going to be sufficient when you're reviewing a course. It doesn't provide the context of the criteria, which says instructions to work with the content in meaningful ways. Watch the video doesn't tell students how to work with that content in a meaningful way. Everyone knows they're supposed to watch the video. So hopefully that distinction will help you explain to faculty what we're looking for. The other thing with A9 is you want to be sure and distinguish this from C6, which is specifically about assessment instructions. And we still see, and our local, um, our CVC reviewers still see a lot of local teams conflating the two. So they'll talk about assessments when they're giving feedback about A9, or they'll talk about videos when they're giving feedback for C6. So you want to make sure we consider those to be two separate contexts supplemental material, which needs instructions for students on how to interact with it, what's expected of them, and then assessment instructions separate. Okay, who's got a comment or um, a question about interpreting A9? Feel free to unmute. And Jennifer, I see you've got your hand up. Go right ahead. Thank you, Helen. So I was the one who had sent you this because this is a... Actually, a couple people did, but you were the oh, okay. first one. Yes, this is a one of the criteria that comes up on our campus a lot, and I, I know you and you said um, it's not enough to just tell the students to watch this video, even uh -huh. if they watch this video about whatever the topic is. But we have this issue a lot where the um, instructions, the video is used to sort of preface the lecture, which follows. So a common example we see is something like please watch, uh, before we get into a lecture on attachment in early childhood uh, education, let's watch this video about the importance of bonding. So that something like that will usually come back as incomplete amongst our reviewers. And then we have the instructor saying, well, the video is like a preface to the upcoming lecture content. So they're making that connection. So given that example, would that, be aligned or not? Um, I have my own thoughts. I'm also going to hand it over to some of our lead people like Sylvia or Leslie or whatever. I, I, my, the question that I would ask the instructor is, great, it's a preface. Why did you choose this one? What's important about this video that you're using it as the preface? And that may give a bit more context for students. Sylvia, what did you want to add? Can you hear me OK? Yep. Okay, so I would add um, when they're going to use that knowledge. So you could say, you know, what you're going to observe in this video will then transition to when they have, you know, the next part. So you don't have to, you know, tell them what they're supposed to learn, but tell them when they will use that learning. I think that was part of the um, suggested uh, criteria as well. Yeah, so kind of the why. Why are they watching this preface before they watch the lecture? What What is it that, um, how will it help them get ready for the lecture? Uh, does it include information that isn't in the lecture that the instructor wants them to be sure to be aware of? Those kinds of things. Does that make sense, Jennifer? It, it does. It does. So I think we, we just need to add a little more, a little more context around our instructions then. Yeah. And, and maybe just helping the instructor understand why are you including the preface, you know, sentence about that to segue into the, um, the lecture. Suzanne posted, she wanted clarification. So watch this video to help you prepare for lecture is enough question mark. <laughs> no. Um, that would not be enough. In what way will it help you prepare? Is it the vocabulary they should be paying attention to? Is it the um, different way of explaining a particular concept? You know, what about why are they, why? For me, that's really what helps me 
help students understand why am I having you watch this video? What is it about this video that is important enough that I feel you need to watch it? And Mick, what did you want to add? So I just had a question about um, what you said about the textbooks, that it's not necessary not necessarily about working with the content from textbooks, but sometimes we can't see the textbook. And so if the instructor gives some very, very brief thing like read chapter nine, how do we know if that is sufficient instructions for working with that particular content? Again, I'm gonna start by throwing it to some of our lead reviewers so that I'm not the only one um, making it the Helen show. Anybody, uh, Sylvia, Leslie, I can't see who else is here. What was the question um, again? Cheryl. It, so if a textbook is being used, does the instructor need to give explanatory information about how to use the textbook? Wait, do you mean publisher, Meg, when you can't have access to it as a reviewer? Yeah, so that's just oh. one example. We might not be able to see the textbook, so we don't know how how the textbook is going to really give adequate instructions either, right? So if if all, all we see is a super brief instruction, read this chapter. Um, I'm just asking because Helen said at the beginning, it doesn't necessarily refer to, A9 doesn't really have to do with textbook content, but more supplemental content. But I've just seen these examples where even their instructions to deal with the textbook content content seem a little lacking. Oh, I see. So I hear what you're saying now. So if there's a physical textbook or ebook, it doesn't matter. And it just says read chapter five. And that's all the instruction. That's kind of a little. But I thought you meant publisher content, you know, where you're. Yeah. yeah. No, I meant like what you said, any kind of textbook content that we can't see, we have no idea how good of a textbook it is or how well the content is explained within the context of the textbook. I just feel like that even if there is great content in the textbook, the instructor could still give a, a plenty of- or You can, you can instructors can always give more than the minimum. We're, I think it's a rabbit hole if we try to ask reviewers to start going down and saying, okay, you need to have the instructor give you access to every textbook. No. It's just going to, so right. what we're really addressing here is making sure we're kind of going on the assumption that the publishers adequately presented and used subheadings and called out knowledge checks and did whatever they do in textbooks. We're kind of assuming that's in place. So the textbook doesn't need a lot of explanatory, but we do know that the supplemental stuff that instructors collate and include because they feel it's really important, they know why it's important, but students often have no idea what they should be paying attention to or why they should be watching it. So we don't want to create such a burden that it becomes impossible to fulfill. We just wanna make sure that kind of supplemental stuff. So that would be my response. Anybody else have something to add about that? Well, uh, yeah, this is Leslie. Um, I, I, I know it's not required and read chapter nine is, we really can't have them say anything further, but we, we always encourage our faculty to say, uh, it, at least put the title of the chapter in when they say read chapter nine, and then that adds context. So we encourage that. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. And local teams can, as Leslie just alluded to, you can have your own local way of doing things that may go beyond or have a specific way of implementing that you're asking all instructors to do. That's absolutely fine. So mm -hmm. if Los Rios District encourages the inclusion of the title of the chapter, which is a great idea, make sure nine wasn't a typo that you actually want them to. Um, so you guys can have your own specific things that you put on top of the rubric. Right. And I think the other distinction is that local is great. Like I know you guys are doing above and beyond, but remember, this is just an alignment. So if it says read chapter nine, you don't hold that up for alignment. 
yes, you suggest that you like the title, but it, again, that's kind of a rabbit hole, right? Because I mean, everybody assumes if it's read chapter nine, but I, I, I hope that you don't get bogged down in that in your reviews, because that's something that you're not going to die on the hill for, for sure. But it will, excuse me, piss off the instructor, <laughs> you know, like if you're, if you're doing those little picky things, that's why it's so important to suggest to them, hey, you know, it would be great help, like Leslie does all the time. It'd be great help if you added the chapter title and just, you know, what it is. But yeah, I've seen that a lot lately. It's like, you know what? Go, let's go on to something else because this this is not going to hold up the alignment. And then you go through all that and it gets to us and we're like, yeah, we're not going to hold that up for alignment. So just keep that in mind. Great. Okay, next thing that people recommended we look at again was A10. And that has to do with optional underscore um, learning support. So it's, we say individualized learning opportunities. We don't necessarily mean the instructor is going through their course roster person by person and coming up with different resources for each student, although they may. But what we're looking at is are the students that are perhaps struggling with concepts, are supplemental um, support, learning supports being offered, whether it's a video or an article or you know, whatever it is, so that if they're struggling with the basic course materials, they have some way of getting additional support to help them. And the same with enrichment. If they're loving a topic, are you is the instructor who is the subject matter expert in this case have they designated a few things that if a student is loving this topic but they're a student they don't necessarily know what else is out there and available to them so we're just wanting instructors to provide some review and enrichment opportunities doesn't have to be in every module doesn't have to be every concept the instructor is going to know what are the things students always stumble over that's what I want to go find some review resources for. What are the topics that may really excite people or that come across my desk and I think, ooh, some students might love this. That's what they can include as the enrichment. The big thing that we see and, and many of our reviewers, it's not always clear that it's optional. And so the poor student thinks, oh my gosh, there's even more material I have to go through. So you want to help your faculty understand that they have to clearly mark it as optional and give it that same context that was asked for in A9. Here's this video that's going to help review. What is it going to help review? Why are you giving them this as an optional or enrichment resource? What about it so that students understand how to interact with it? The human brain is such that if we don't understand something, we're going to bypass it. If, if I don't know why I should watch that, I'm not going to watch it. I got other things to do. So you want to help the faculty understand, A, that it needs to be clearly designated as optional. And I have found that words like supplemental or additional, that's not always clear to students that it means optional. The instructor knows they mean optional when they say that, or here's more that you use the word optional that way there will be no ambiguity for the student as to whether they have to watch it or they can choose to watch it so making sure it's clearly designated as optional and then giving it a context is it a review if it is review what concepts or ideas or task or skill is it um, focused on and with enrichment what is this about? Why would a student want to watch this or read this or go watch, the, go look at this website or whatever the resource is? Who's got something to add about A10, either a question or a, a best practice that you guys use? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands up. Is there anything I missed in chat, Cheryl, that should be addressed about this? No, I think they're going back and forth about reiterating some um, techniques. Okay. Helen, Helen, yes. this is Nasreen Rahim Go ahead, from Nasreen. Green Valley College. Sorry, I, I was late in raising my hand. That's fine. Go right ahead. So um, 
somebody had mentioned, you know, play pause it. I think one of the best practices for uh, supplemental or optional or anything to do with uh, publisher content, it's always good to have like some uh, play pause it video or a short clip or even an audio to clarify. And I think that work, that's one of the best practices that work for me. Do you mean to give students an explanation about the particular resource? Yes. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another, thank you for sharing that, Nasreen. Another question we get is how many is enough? What, how many need to be in the course for it to be considered aligned? And the rubric doesn't specify, it just says individual learning opportunities are provided. Our rule of thumb is kind of what we do with self-assessment uh, self and things. Three would be great. When I'm working with an instructor in Course Design Academy, I always tell them I would like to see at least three individual learning opportunities throughout your 16 or 7 week, teen week course. If you've got more, fabulous. And I also plant the seed. Now that you have these and you understand what we're looking for, keep your antenna alert for more opportunities that you can add to the course later so that you're building this library of resources. You don't have to stop at three, but we'd like to see at least three. Um, Sarah had a question about extra credit, but I can't find her to. I'm here. Oh, okay. oh there Sarah you are. Okay. I'm here. Yes, sorry about that. I couldn't, um, the raise hand uh, feature wasn't, wasn't working. enabled for me. So <laughs> thank you for looping back. Um, I just had a question. Um, this came up um, with um, a faculty team member I was working with last semester who had lots of learning support. Um, some of which were marked optional, but some she also provided extra credit for. And I'm just kind of curious, is providing extra credit for this additional support, does that make it um, not quite aligned? Does it have to be really clearly marked as optional? Or can that extra credit be something, um, you know, an extra incentive for the students to participate in it, the students who need it? There's no nothing clear cut in the rubric about that. Um, it's kind of a philosophical or pedagogical decision. And there's a lot of discussion now in the equitable grading conversation about the idea of extra credit. Um, so I, I, I'm, I don't think, I don't know. Um, our reviewers, do you consider when you're doing reviews, do you consider, let's talk together. Do we consider if something is marked as extra credit would we consider that it falls into this category of optional learning support? People are thinking. Flip a coin. <laughs> Tony, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it kind of seems to uh, miss the purpose because if you have people that need extra help and then you're giving them the more advanced resources or people who need advanced resources, you're making them go back and do rudimentary things. It seems to kind of miss a connection there for me. Yeah, I, I, I generally don't count that as um, the uh, learning support. Uh, it, it's great, extra credit is wonderful, but um, and maybe falls in C8 a little bit more, I don't know. Thank you, Sylvia. So I think it depends on what it is. Let's say for example, um, to do a virtual field trip on a specific topic or a suggested list, that would be, you know, if you want to find out more about this area, you can go do this. So that would be for advanced learning. So I would look to see what it is and what the purpose is. If it's just go to any performance and show me your ticket, and they don't have to write anything, then I would not. So I think it depends. As a group to norm this, do we have a consensus on whether extra credit should not be considered or whether it's kind of situational, whether extra credit would be considered fulfilling A10? Mostly they're saying situational. situational. The, are we discussing the word optional? No, because I think, don't, I mean, it's, I, I think it's pretty clear to students that extra credit means optional. Right. 
And so, so that part, it, it's more whether the, I think the question is because it has the potential to earn credit, does that remove it from this idea of learning support? I don't think so because it's optional, whether it's points or not, right? But now so, if they only had extra credit in there and yeah, if maybe they, that's, if they, yeah. Oh, well, okay, let's hear from John. Yeah, so hi everyone. I, I'm not sure that it really makes it, it's like how many angels fit on the head of a pen. Mm -hmm. I think the key here may be to identify which thing it is in the text if you need a little bit more help with editing your paper you can do this mm -hmm. versus if you're interested in learning about norse archaeology further click here um the distinctions between those two are pretty clear and I, maybe it's just all in the wording of it rather than whether it's one or the other great point thank you so if we as a group accept the premise that it's kind of situational and the fact that something is extra credit doesn't necessarily mean it wouldn't qualify as an additional learning support. Are people comfortable with that? And using guidelines like what John just suggested, you know, that it's clear what kind of support it is and how it would further the student's learning then whether it's providing points for their grade or not is kind of an irrelevancy. Okay, it looks like we're pretty, I'm not seeing any huge no's. And um, so we can consider that a norm amongst ourselves and something you'll wanna be sure and pass to your local teams that this idea of extra credit fulfilling the A10 would be situational. And the main criteria are that it's clearly marked that it be optional and that it be understood how it's supporting. Is it a review or an enrichment kind of uh, resource? Excellent. Love that. Any questions or further comment about that before we go on to the next couple of things? I want to make sure you feel heard. So if you're feeling shy, you could put something in chat or you can unmute. Yes, Grace. Hi, just just for clarification, because uh, I had a question, but I think it got lost um, with our discussion. Do optional ungraded uh, concept check quizzes, would that count as learner support? It could. And, and what I would think is it's kind of like self-assessment. If it's just telling them right or wrong, it isn't necessarily a resource. It's really more just a, yeah, I did good or no, I didn't do good. So this is really mostly looking for resources. What you're describing, I would think would fall more under the category of self-assessment. Does that distinction make sense? Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. Anything else about A10? Okay, the other two, well, there's just a couple more. Um, and let me go here. B2 and B3 are ones that a couple people said they seem to find faculty and even local reviewers kind of getting a little mixed up about them. So B2 is what we call regular effective contact. And in the last DE call, I believe what I heard, and you guys can correct me, is the state is now going to regular and substantive interaction and is no longer using REC. So we may need to change this so that it falls in line. But really, it's essentially, they're this, we're talking about the same thing. But we call this regular effective contact. And what we mean is the instructor built into the course are ways that the instructor can not only be communicating, so they're using announcements, they're using the feedback tool, they're using whatever the inbox, and that an explanation for students of when and how the communication is gonna happen is included. 
So alignment is not enough that the instructor communicates. What you're also going to be looking for as a reviewer is, is an explanation included, whether it be in the syllabus or in the orientation module or whatever, that's not so important as that it be there and clearly defined so that students understand when and how to expect communication from the instructor. And so it may include contact me via the inbox. I will be using the feedback tool. I'll be chiming in on discussions periodically, whatever it is. But that's what you're looking for is, is it being explained to students what to expect? Question about that one or comment about that one? Ellen? Yes, go yeah. ahead, Alana. When I see B2. Oh, Sylvia, sorry. Oh, sorry. When I see B2 incomplete, mostly it's because they didn't mention anything about announcements. So, so we, something. yeah, and, and let's norm that together. In the explanation of when and how communication will happen, are we expecting that faculty are going to mention all of the different avenues or just some of them? What do we as reviewers think is enough in that explanation? So if they explain discussions, grade book, inbox, but they don't talk about announcements, do we mark it incomplete or do we say, well, the students know what to expect in those other ways and we're not gonna worry about announcements? Thoughts and opinions. All communication tools or just some communication tools? I think it's really important to have a sort of minimum, for example, how often you respond or how quickly you respond to emails. Some things absolutely you have to say and other things I think aren't as critical. And the response time is on B3. Thank you, Vicki. So we will definitely get to that part. Um, okay, so I, it looks like I'm seeing kind of a split between they got to mention them all or they can mention most of them. Ellen? Uh, Yes, Sylvia. So I would say whatever they mention, they need to say, um, you know, how they're how often they're going to do it or how involved they're going to be. Because I don't think an instructor should be forced to use announcements. Maybe yeah. they have pronto and they're going to be doing it that way. You know, uh -huh. so I think whatever they say, they're going. You know, if there's discussions and if if they mention that they're using that, then include all the details of that. The how and the when. Okay, great. And then Marilyn. Oh, I think Sylvia covered what I was going to say. Okay. Yes, anything. Thank you. You bet. Okay, so are we as a group happy with whatever tools they mention for communication? They're describing, they're giving the how and when so a student knows what to expect, but they don't have to mention every possible tool. Uh, Alana. So I am curious about the condensation of classes. When classes are being condensed to eight weeks and five weeks and things like that, um, I've been told that um, the number of discussions or, or contacts need to multiply out. So for instance, if a class was a 16 week and went to an 18 week, then instead of having 16 discussions in a 16 week class, you now need to have 16 discussions in an eight week class in order to be compliant with this? That is not accurate. We do not, in the rubric, your college may be different. In the rubric, we do not require any number of discussions at all. We're just saying students need to know when and how you will be communicating and interacting with them. In terms of state guidelines around either REC or RSI, your college will probably almost certainly have specific guidelines about how many discussions or whatever. I mean, if, a if as a student, if I'm in three classes and I have a ding dang discussion every week in every class, I'm gonna be irritated as heck. But so we also wanna help <clears throat> instructors realize there are other ways of getting interaction going on, but it's a college designation as to how many discussions need to be included in any kind of course. It has nothing to do with alignment with the rubric. Does that help, Alana? Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, Tony. 
Sorry, I got pulled away from the computer for a minute um, on this question. Like right now I'm reviewing a course and there is no REC. There's just a communication page, which is basically how the um, student is going to be communicating in, in the course. And so I have to I have to really hunt to see, oh, this teacher is going to be grading the papers paper assignments, you know, um, within a week, or they're going to be responding to emails here. Like I don't, it, I have to really search for it. So if I'm searching for it that hard, is it then not aligned? Again, let's bring it to the group. I would be inclined to say yes, because if we as reviewers are having trouble finding information, we know hands down students are having trouble finding that same information. And the point of all of this is not the letter of the law it's is it easy for is it making learning easier for students and so if they can't find this information that's not making it easier for them so we want to encourage the faculty to just have a page i've got a template they can use in course design resources all they got to do is change if you i mean so does that help, Tony? And I think are other people nodding. Would we agree that if it's really hard to find, it's not going to be aligned? I see Leslie emphatically yes, nodding. Yes. yes. Okay. And it's so easy to put that just that one sentence, that commitment to the students. I I will communicate with you weekly, regularly, do, using in these ways. Yeah, yeah. it's one sentence. It's just uh, clarifies everything. Yeah, so easy to find isn't specifically indicated, but I think that's kind of a rule of thumb that we all want to carry with us because if we're not finding it, the students aren't going to be finding it. Thanks, Tony. Marilyn. Yeah, I, 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 I don't. I'm trying not to make this too complicated, but it just seems to me that if an instructor had an announcement that said, "This is the way I'm going to communicate with you during the entire course." And it's in the announcements, and it's something that's right at the top of your screen every time you come into your the uh, your home page. That's not something a student has to look for because it's an announcement that stands. It's always there. And for myself, I put a little. Uh, I have an icon I think that says "Ask a Question," and uh, it takes you to a, a canvas page where you can ask a question. But I have it on every page of my. Uh, on my canvas so that if you have a question there's no doubt that you can wait how you can communicate with me you don't have to look you don't have to go to the inbox you don't have to look for an announcement you know, it's right there on that screen so i think part of it is if we if we offer up different ways to make it easy for an instructor put the because that's an easy thing to do um then because uh, a, a lot of instructors is not that they don't want to comply or align they just don't have the technological knowledge to to do to set up their courses or even know that there are different ways of doing that makes it really easy. Right, and that's where the local work with the faculty is gonna come into play. And again, we're not legislating in the rubric what communication methods need to be used. We just wanna make sure whatever methods an instructor has chosen, they've explained that to the student so that the students know what to expect. That's what we're going to be looking for. And can I and just add? Go ahead. That that just sounds like a, a student interaction, a student initiated interaction, rather than you're initiated, what you're going to initiate. So it sounds more like B three. Yeah. And they're you know they're kind of hand in glove. Yeah. In a sense. Okay. So. That was B2. It was really the explanation for students was the, the key thing that- Well, and one quickie, one quickie that keeps going by really fast. Um, Ruth, she was told that she had to have a group project in order to comply with student-to-student -student interaction. But okay, I, that, that's a different rubric item and- Oh, sorry. No, that's okay. And that would be inaccurate from the CVC OEI perspective. Your college may have a guideline that you have to, and they can tell you that. But to be aligned with the rubric, you need to have student to student interaction present, but it does, you don't have to include a group project. I think but, if we have time to, we should talk about that a little bit about where the line comes between a course being aligned for badging and of course being aligned for the local college because there's a lot of you know 
rocks in this, in the way sometimes, but if you want the course to get badged, we should talk about the local college keeping it back for those things that, you know what I mean? Like it's already aligned with us, but they have other things that they want. So it'll yeah. never get badged, <clears throat> you know? Anyway, it's a topic for me later. Okay, well, let's go through these and then we can come back to that. So, so B3 was the one that um, Vicky alluded to, come on, there we go. Where what's often missing with B3 is the response time. So you want to make sure reviewers are looking for the response time, not just you can contact me via the inbox and here's my email address or whatever. But we want to let students know what to expect. So if they don't hear from the instructor within the 24 hours or a week or whatever, they know, oh, I should have already heard. I better contact them again. If you don't tell them, they're just left wondering and either they'll contact you every 10 minutes because they don't know that you said within 48 hours or they just think you're ignoring them because they don't realize. So we want to make sure faculty are including a response time. Comments or questions about B3. And this is another one where it needs to be easily found. The contact information is easily found. So if you as a reviewer are hunting for their contact information, it's not aligned. Anything else about these two? I have a quick question about that. Go right ahead, Teresa. Because uh, I have heard a lot of discussion among reviewers about this easily found mm -hmm. thing. And so uh, some people think that if it's in the, in, in the syllabus, then that's good enough. And I think that maybe that's true. Maybe that depends on how easy the syllabus is to find. I don't know. Just wondering what you think. Uh, personally, I, I would agree with your second comment. It depends on how easy, how well formatted the syllabus is. If something is given a heading, you know, like tech support or contact me or whatever it is that is supposedly designated as easy to find. If it's buried in a bunch of text on the syllabus, that's not going to be easy to find. But if it has its own separate heading, that's going to be pretty easy to find. What are other people's thoughts? I mean, there's no clear definition of what easy to find means, but if you find yourself hunting for something, that's a pretty good indication that it's not very easy to find. Helen? Yeah, go ahead. Hi. Um, I've had this one when I go over these reviews with faculty and they'll have this part of the information at the bottom of the syllabus or at the bottom of their welcome page. So I just say, let's put that right on the top and right. miss it. So right on top of the syllabus or right on, and as well as on top of that welcome page, this is how you can contact me. So that helps. And then I say, oh, they probably missed it. And yeah, it's way at the bottom underneath a lot of other information. Yeah. Just yeah. make the placement right on the top of whatever right. the welcome or the syllabus page. And they can even leave it where they had it. Just also put it. I mean, you know, it, yeah, Christina, great point. Thank you. Anything else about this one? Initiating contact at response times. I'm pausing to give you processing time. Okay. Three more were suggested. C1 and C2, authenticity. That's one that seems to be a pretty big stumbling point. And some people err on the side of, if it's in the course, we'll say it's aligned. Other people err on the side of, it has to be specifically authentic. And so it can be kind of a sticky wicket. Um, what we're looking for is at least the language of the rubric. And that's what you want to use as your guide and help your reviewers remember to use as their guide. The activities lead to a demonstration of learning outcomes. It is possible for quiz questions to be framed in such a way that students are actually demonstrating knowledge. 
It's also possible for quizzes to be, they could guess their way through and they're not really demonstrating anything except a pretty good aptitude at guessing. So the fact that something, an assessment is a quiz doesn't inherently mean it's inauthentic but you kind of got to look at it with a little bit more care than you would a project where they're being asked to demonstrate something in a more discernible way. But I want to hear other thoughts. How do other people, what criteria do you use as a reviewer when you're looking to determine authenticity? And Meg, I see your hand up. Well, I'm sorry, I had a question about something other than what you just posed. Helen, oh, okay, so can you hold on away. to it for a bit? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So when it, you're looking to do... C1, but not what you... Okay. Um, anybody want to share what you, how you determine authenticity? And I see some things in chat. I don't know how to say your name. I'm going to probably uh, say Loi. it wrong. Loi? Loi, yes, ma'am. Loi. Um, yeah, we actually, we sometimes, um, like, um, we review courses that not that are not our major. Like, I'm computer science, right. but it's a music course. So we look at the assignment. Um, uh, if it's a real-life um, example, for example, demonstrate your ability to play a piece by recording yourself and right. your hands uh, playing the notes and such. So we try to, does, is, does this meet the objective for that course or the outcome? Um, so it's like a blind man, you know, feeling his way around the room, but uh, it's not that difficult. Um, yeah, that's what thank we you. Do, really. Thank you. Yeah, and, and that is a question I have gotten before is, this isn't my subject matter. How do I know if it's authentic? The key word is demonstration. Can you tell in what students are being asked to do are they actually having to demonstrate in some way, whether it be by choosing the correct response to a case study or you know something like that, or as in Loai's example, are they actually filming themselves playing the piece? Are they demonstrating the learning their um, the learning outcomes? Okay, Sylvia, look at the outcomes for the course and then see if there are assessments that can be mapped to the outcome. Assessments of any kind, discussion, quiz, project, essay, you know, whatever it is. If there's an outcome, but there's no assessment to measure it, C1 would be incomplete. Um, be, thank you, Sylvia. And, that, yeah, and I would give the instructor, I mean, they're the content expert, you know, subject matter expert. So if they're doing an assessment and it mentions just that topic or something, you know, I give them the benefit of the doubt. I'm not there to analyze, you know, exactly what the student's being tested on. Oh, you didn't test them on this key term. You know, I think we need to give them the benefit of the doubt. Right. Yeah. And, and so really the connection to the learning outcomes and the demonstration of it is really the piece that we're looking at. Before we go on to C2, Meg, what was your question about C1? And if anyone else has a comment or question about C1. Okay, thank you, Han. So my question is about the um, exemplary element for C1. So assessments are designed to mimic authentic environments to facilitate transfer. So I always wonder about that word transfer because you know, pedagogically, it can be um, used to refer to information you have in one context that you're transferring to a new context. But when they talk about authentic environments, I always wonder, do they mean, can you transfer this knowledge into an authentic environment? Do you, I'm not sure I'm making myself clear, but I've always wondered, like, exactly how do they mean that word transfer? I think for this the purposes of what we're doing i mean i understand the pedagogical distinction of what you're asking about i don't think you need to worry about that for this if there if the assessment is an authentic in that it's replicating in some way the actual situation in which the skill or knowledge would be used great you can mark it exemplary i i wouldn't worry about whether it's the transfer from page to assessment or assessment to actual situation. It's just the idea to help faculty understand that the more authentic assessment is, the better likely the learning is gonna be. So helping them aim toward that rather than just 
multiple choice after multiple choice after multiple choice. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, does anyone else have a comment about that? The exemplary for C1. Okay. Great. The thing that some people, a couple of people wrote about C2 is validity, which is the assessments appear to, and I love that we put in appear to, I don't know where we got that from, but it's there and it's stuck. They appear to align with course objectives. That partly might be a nod to the fact that reviewers are not supposed to be in the same discipline as the instructor. So we can only make our best guess that the assessments are aligning with the objectives. But C1 and C2 kind of go together, but this really has to do with um, the what is being assessed in relation to what were the expressed outcomes. And a lot of people, uh, how do I wanna phrase this? You can either use the SLOs or the unit level. You don't have to only use SLOs or only use unit level. If the assessments are, because in theory, the unit level objectives are chunked from, they're leading to the SLOs. So if assessments are aligning with either set of objectives, that's fine. We just wanna make sure that assessments that have nothing to do with what students have been taught are not being included. And as Sylvia pointed out earlier, if a learning objective has been stated, are students being assessed on that? Are they being held accountable for having learned whatever the stated objective was? So it's kind of two sides of the coin. Are there assessments in there that don't belong there? And are all of the assessments that should be there, there? Hopefully that makes sense. And does anyone have a comment or a question about that? Ellen, I do. Yes. So I just want to say an example of C2 incomplete is I reviewed a course and I, there was an assessment that I think was like their favorite assessment. Hey, I really want students to do this. You know, they learned so much, but it had nothing to do with the outcomes. They just liked that assessment. So um, that's just one example. And it couldn't be really be tied in to anything that they were learning. It was just like their favorite thing. You know, sometimes faculty, they just have all this knowledge in their head yes. and so many cool things, but in one course, especially introduction course, it, it's hard to be able yeah. to tell students everything. Yeah, thank you. And that actually what comes to my mind, recommend in a little note in your feedback, hey, this would be a great learning resource to fulfill A10, but it doesn't help fulfill you know, validity. So it's not that they can't have those supplemental things, but it may not be um, appropriate as a required part of the course because it really has nothing to do with the learning objectives of the course. Thanks, Sylvia. And Mick. Sorry, thank you. So um, Sylvia's great little wrap up there uses a distinction between C1 and C2. Um, between looking at the outcomes and looking at the objectives. So um, I was just wondering if you have a great place that is a nice, succinct explanation that you can point faculty to, because that can sometimes be- An explanation uh, of what? Oh, the differences between outcomes and objectives. Like if you look that up, there's like 5 million things that- Exactly, and that's why we're not gonna attempt it <laughs> because every school uses different terms and we've yeah. had in norming calls, conversations about no it's an objective no it's a goal uh, no it's a it's yeah. like no this is what we're it, it's it's just too big a can of worms so we yeah. don't try to legislate it that way but be more of a local conversation we are talking about learning outcomes whether they're called goals or objectives or outcomes we mean the measurable things that students are expected to have mastered as a result of taking the course and that could be SLOs or the unit level. It's it's a great question, Meg, and just not one that 
There's no silver bullet. Yeah, there's, there's no there's no <laughs> yeah. clear cut answer because yeah. the terminology is so ambiguous. Right. And that really throws instructors. Yeah. When they're trying to, because they might have learned it one way and we yeah. and a reviewer might be applying it another way. It's a test of their fluidity and their, their neuro flexibility. <laughs> okay. I like that. Um, okay. Anything else about C1 or C2? Then we have one more people wanted to talk about. And then we can open it up to whatever you want to talk about. Maybe George Clooney's marriage. Um, okay. C8 was the last one. Self-assessment. So the purpose of this is to help students get a sense of where they, how they're doing in the course. So there's a couple of things that faculty don't always <clears throat> seem to understand. And so we wanna make sure you as reviewers are understand, helping them understand. The intent is that if a student is off track, that they have time to get back on track. So having a self-assessment in week 15 of a 16 week course is not very useful to a student. So you wanna help faculty understand that self-assessments are, are most effective when they're in the first say two thirds of the course. Secondly, a big thing that we're looking for is students can't always determine how they're doing. Just because they've done a self-assessment doesn't mean they know how to uh, properly interpret the results of that self-assessment. So we want to make sure there is some kind of feedback mechanism that the instructor is involved with, whether it be a knowledge check in Canvas and the instructor has added um, customized responses to the quiz answers the way Canvas allows you to do, saying, hey, you didn't quite get this one. Please go back and reread page whatever, or here's an article that will explain it in a different way, or whatever it is. There's some kind of customized feedback from the instructor. So it could be built in, like in the quizzes, or maybe the self-assessment mechanism is a muddiest point and the instructors reading them all and they're responding to students that are clearly showing that they need some help understanding that's a, a feedback mechanism as well that is perfectly appropriate the kinds of things that wouldn't fulfill alignment are email me if you have a question well the student may not even know that they don't understand so they won't know that they should have a question so that's not going to be an effective self-assessment um, mechanism it's some kind of activity and the instructor is engaged in looking at the students responses and giving them resources or guidance if they appear to be off track does that bring up a question or a comment from anyone Okay. I'm gonna take it to mean people feel pretty confident about, oh, Jenna, C8, a publisher has content related self-assessments. Anytime you're talking about publisher content, when we do reviews, and I would assume also at the local level, you're asking the instructor to take you in there and show you that content so you can verify that it is in fact meeting alignment. You don't wanna assume either that it's not meeting alignment or that it is meeting alignment, you want to make sure they're showing you, whether it be a screenshot or they give you a little tour. We often have our reviewers, the faculty will give us a little tour or you know, they give you their login credentials, whatever. But you want to be able to go into the publisher content to verify whether it be for C8 or in C6 with this instructions, whatever it is, validity, all that stuff. So. Publisher content is always a little bit of an extra step and faculty need to understand that they have to let us in there to see so we can determine whether it's aligned or not. Hopefully, Jenna, that makes sense. And Helen, can we talk about uh, quizzes with multiple attempts? We cannot. No, yes, of course we can. Go ahead. Oh, I, I, well, I, I, I think that with quizzes with multiple attempts, there still needs to be feedback. Yes in in the quiz itself yes 
whether yes. they cho chose a correct answer or incorrect answer. Is that is that right? Right. And and so right and wrong, and this is research based, and I'm not a research person, but I love researching about assessments and all of that. And one of the things that it's very clear is just telling students right or wrong does not impact their retention or understanding. They need to also be provided with some kind of guidance along with it. So that's the piece um, Leslie's talking about, even in a quiz. You can have multiple attempts and maybe they get two attempts and the first attempt, you just tell them right or wrong. And the second attempt, that's when they get the, um, uh, I think Canvas lets you do this. That's when they get the results. Result, yeah, the yeah, the 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 results with feedback. So, so you can and incorrect. And yeah, you can set it up in different ways, but at some point, they need to be given actual feedback and guidance, not just simply right wrong. But there's nothing wrong with multiple attempts. You just want to make sure feedback is part of it. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. And this is another one where we want to see at least three. More is great, but at least three. So as reviewers, you're looking for three. It can be three different kinds. They don't have to, if they've done one quiz assess, self-assessment and a muddiest point self-assessment and a reflection, you know, they can do whatever. Just three opportunities for students to get a sense of how they're doing. Are they understanding? Do they need guidance to get back on track? And that's for a 16, 17 week course. Yes, if it's an eight week, two would be accept acceptable. And Katie says, self-assessments do not need open-ended feedback. It can have automated feedback. As long as it's meaningful feedback, absolutely, Katie. Um, whoops, you missed it is not meaningful feedback. Whoops, you missed it, go back and read this, or here's another article, that would be sufficient. So I'm sorry I had to get up for a second, but I just want to clarify one thing. If you have um, an automated quiz or something that they're taking yeah. and they have multiple attempts at that quiz, does that qualify as self-assessment? It could qualify as self-assessment for our purposes as long as there is meaningful feedback being provided for wrong answers. Okay, thank you. You bet. Anything else about self-assessment? Helen? Yes. Can we just talk a little bit about points? So if they get like one or two points for that or multiple tries, fine. But if it's a regular assessment that's worth 50 points or a big part of the grade, that's just a regular assessment that they're taking. Right. Self-assessments are invariably either low stakes or no stakes. And the point is to help students understand if they're understanding what they should be. It's not a regular assessment that is contributing to their grade because the point of a self-assessment is to give them feedback so they can improve their grade for later. Thanks for pointing that out, Sylvia. And Dina, anything less than eight should have at least two self-assessment opportunities. I mean, a, a four week, Maybe we could make a case, just one, um, but we'd have to look at it as a case by case. It really kind of depends on the topic and, and um, how much information students are being expected to master in that four weeks. It's a little bit situational. Did um, you see Meg's question? I did not. Uh, okay, so is it fine to have whoops, you missed it in quiz? If if quizzes only have whoops, you missed it, that would not qualify as a self-assessment. It can be there. It can be a knowledge check, and that's fine. It wouldn't be one of the three unless it had that additional feedback. But if they had those knowledge checks with only right or wrong, and they had at least three other self-assessment opportunities, that would be fine because those quizzes would not be um, applied to the criteria for self-assessment. Does that make sense, Meg? Okay. Can I um, go back to C8? And yeah, you're in a situation where uh, you find it, because we ran into this where a course, uh, it was made up of several quizzes throughout the course that had multiple attempts 
feedback was provided. And at the end of it all, it totaled up to about 40% of the grade. That would not be self-assessment. Okay. Because so again, self-assessment is to help them improve their grade. It doesn't contribute to their grade. Okay. In a meaningful way. I mean, some people, we use points because we want to encourage students to do it. But if it's contributing to 40% of their grade, that's pretty significant. Wouldn't you agree? I, I wonder if, because when you talk about low stakes versus high stakes, uh, we are running into courses where they want to be more project based. So mm -hmm. essentially, it's zero high stakes exams. And it's more like going through more formative assessments and, you know, different projects throughout. And then at the end, it's a total accumulation towards 100% of your grade. So, um, well, C7 is about variety and asks that there are both summative and formative. So if a course is only formative, it wouldn't meet C7. Maybe there's, if, if I'm understanding what you're talking about, there's a series of formative, but then there's some kind of cumulative thing where they are demonstrating mastery of all of it. It's not just you write your headline, and then you do this and then you know they maybe the summative is okay now you've got your entire project give me a three minute reflection on what you learned about that you know that would be a summative and then the value of that summative would have to be a significant part of the grade see and that's that's why i'm bringing it up because um you know we might all come across courses where people are saying well we're getting away from the more traditional style right. of, of assessment. What big getting, exam where everything hinges on that. Yeah, so we wouldn't want people to feel limited right. by the rubric. That's what I'm saying. Right, right. But you do want to have not just a series of disconnected formative things. You want to make sure you're helping students master something in its entirety. And so some kind of summative concluding assessment would be appropriate yeah and i sorry if i'm repeating myself but in terms of the value of that summative assessment right if, if it's something where it's like the you know the grand total of 100 percent, it's not um it's it's like let's say it's only like 10 percent of the total mm -hmm. grade but it's required you know what yeah. i mean and it's so much yeah yeah so, so I don't C7 think seven wouldn't C seven or C eight wouldn't determine right how much of the grade it it is, yeah. Okay, you are correct, Nazreen. I see your hand up. Yes, um, I just needed a clarification. I always get stuck there. So you know, I I feel that you know the summative assessment adds to the authenticity. Am I correct to feel it that way or because it, it could, I mean, it should, yes, but um, it, it, summative is more about the, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it, it's looking at the whole, whereas formative is really kind of yeah. along the way, how are you doing building pieces scaffolding and then the summative is looking at a, an accumulation of learning rather than pieces of learning yes I, the reason i bring it up because there's always this question of how do you know that the student is the student who's taking the class i mean i know that there are a lot of uh, arguments can go on there but just on the you know face value is that that the more of the summative assessment will you know is kind of a protection i i mean that's my inner feeling but i may be wrong totally yeah and the question of is it really the student is outside the scope of what, what we yeah, can yes, cover here yes. yeah no just just uh, wanted to share this yeah, little feeling you. that i have thank you um cynthia let me look and then we can wrap up because we got 10 minutes if smaller quizzes have multiple attempts and they use feedback could the final scores earned? Well, it, 
I'm if I'm understanding your question, what I think you're saying is if they're taking a series of quizzes that totals 40% of the grade, is that considered summative? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, I was thinking of the situation that I believe Sean was describing, and I was trying to think of why an instructor might put that level of value on that experience within the course is perhaps it was because it was of importance at the end for them to have a certain level of knowledge or understanding or performance, but the students were allowed attempts to get there and use the feedback to get better. So it wouldn't necessarily be a separate summative, but I, I was kind of basing it off of what I believe Sean was maybe seeing in a course, and I thought that was interesting. Okay, thank you. So we have 10 minutes left. Any last comments or questions about anything we've talked about today or some other burning local poker issue that you'd like to bring up? Helen, I'm curious about um, the differences between what we're doing for becoming badged for the CBC and this, um, the local standards. I mean, to me, it seems to defeat the purpose if we're setting standards that are so much higher than what the CBC requires and we're not getting our courses badged. And that's kind of what Cheryl was talking about. Before we go there, and thank you for asking it, I just want to answer Ryan real quickly. We are not planning to add an equity section to the rubric. There is the Peralta rubric, and some colleges have incorporated that into their own local usage. Um, but currently, the CVC OEI is not planning to make that a mandated part of the rubric at this point. We definitely are focusing on equity as is everybody and the chancellor's office and all of that. Um, but right now we didn't wanna change the rubric in that way. So um, not currently, Ryan. And Alana and Cheryl have brought up the point about colleges having additional or um, I don't wanna use the word stringent, more emphatic guidelines than what is expected in the CVC rubric. There's nothing saying a college can't, but I see both of their points in that they may, that doing so has the potential of preventing courses that would be aligned by CVC standards. And keep in mind, aligned is, is kind of like this is the least we expect from instructors. It doesn't mean it's necessarily a fabulous course. It just means we want to see at least these things so that we know the course is going to serve students well. So the college may say, well, yeah, that's a great starting point. And we also want to see this, this, and this. It can prevent a course that could be quality reviewed in the course finder from getting that designation because it doesn't meet the college guidelines. We're not going to tell colleges they can't. That may be a question that you all want to discuss in the consortium meetings so that um, it can be kind of college to college. I see the, act, the potential pitfall but I don't think it's something the OEI is going to come in and say, you have to submit courses according to what we say is appropriate. And then you can go back and rebat, you know, a college can do whatever. Um, are there other thoughts about it? I have a follow-up if I could ask. Yes. So I, just to go back a little bit, not to beat a dead horse, but I want to make sure that I'm clearly communicating um, back at my college because I was in a meeting just a few days ago where the conversation um, captured the idea that the impression was that CDC OEI was moving in the direction of formally um, incorporating something like Peralta College's eight equity standards. And so the idea we, we were talking about was if that is in fact coming down the pike, then we wanna make sure that we're using stronger language beyond encourage. 
And so if you can just kind of, I know you said it, but I want to, I want to say that to you and then have you double down so that I can <laughs> clearly communicate or if you want to modify, I want to hear that clearly too. She wants you on record. I will double down <laughs> that I, Helen, am not aware of any formal intention of the CVC mm -hmm. incorporating the equity rubric into the existing rubric. Nor they I. They don't listen to me always, so it may be the decisions are being made that I'm not privy to. And so, but from what Cheryl, Sean, and I know, it's not something that is formally being considered to be added. And we've had so many conversations about that. Time. Because, yeah, it's available on our website so that colleges can incorporate it. Yeah, I'm sure, you know, something can change. But the other is just to focus. And the reason we're focusing on aligning courses, we love exemplary, but we're focusing on alignment because the task is to make sure that the colleges are able to ramp up. And what's that word? Um, Oh, whatever. I can't think of the word right now. Get bigger, sustain, you know, what's that word? Whatever. We want you guys to be able to do it faster and better. But if you're really getting, you know, too exemplary, then that might be why some of the courses aren't getting through as fast, you know? So adding an equity thing to it, I think would just bog us down a little scale thank you people i love you scale is the yeah. word um thank you and so equity is great and it obviously is going to support student success the more we all just have it be like accessibility the more it's the water mm -hmm. we swim in all the time the better it's going to be for students but in terms of formally adding a section e i'm not aware of any plans to do that at this time and Nicole and Nazreen, once a course has been badged, we don't see any reason why you couldn't remove OEI reviewer from the um, master course shell. That would be fine. Please do. And Sylvia, I want to um, follow up with Sylvia's congratulation to everyone. We definitely are seeing substantial progress and improvement in all the local team's ability to interpret alignment and, and give their get their faculty to that point of quality reviewed courses. So thank you so much. I mean, literally at the beginning of this process, way whenever I started four or five years ago, courses would come in with 40 out of 44 incompletes. We're no longer seeing that. We're seeing all kinds of great stuff that you guys are doing. So thank you so much for, for being there for your faculty. Any other comments or questions? We have two and a half minutes. You're very welcome. Thank you for showing up and providing your input. Thank you. Uh, Meg. Oh, excuse me, Tony, you had your hand up first. Yeah, I thought I read something the other day that said the federal guidelines remove student to student oh, interaction. I saw that and I meant to address it. Um, we are not taking interaction out of and they didn't actually remove it from the federal guidelines. They dumbed it down. Mm -hmm. So it's not as um, useful to students as we think it might be, but we don't have plans to change section B in the rubric so you can let your faculty know the OEI says so. Okay, and Mick. Yes, is there a way to, even if I am tracking my own reviewers and how often they attend norming sessions, is there a way to verify that with you or do you verify it? I will talk about, I, will, I, I got your email and I just didn't have time before the call. I'll respond okay. to you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, Zoom Zoom lets us know who was here. So we, Colleen, we will know that people were here. You don't need to like go fill out a checklist or anything. And the last thing I want to, am I still sharing my screen? Are you still seeing my screen? The last thing I want to remind you all is I will put the recording on the homepage of the local poker resource site. You'll see it'll down, be down with the past meetings. That's where the links are to all of the previous ones. And once today's recording is rendered, 
I will add it there. We'll get it captioned. That usually takes a little bit longer, but the link will be there today or tomorrow. And then caption, accurate captions will show up probably sometime next week. Thank you, everybody. Um, I always love meeting with you all, and I will look forward to seeing you. When was the date? January. January something. Let me go back real quickly so we know when it was. January 19th, after your lovely holidays. See you then. Thanks for being here. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Helen. I learned a new vocabulary word today. Conflating. Oh, <laughs> thank you. I learn new vocabulary with Helen all the time. No, but I just got one today. I was kind of disappointed because I think <laughs> one time it was like three words and I was just like, I don't remember what they were. <laughs> so she's keeping it making, for me. Making me blush. Okay, bye. Bye.